God wants us to be deep in our rootedness in Him. We started seven weeks ago on this brand new journey together entitled Rooted. And today is our last of these, this series of seven weeks. I want to go back, if I may, and talk about the importance of the fact that God doesn't want us to have a church that is a mile wide and an inch deep, but rather He wants us to have a church that's a mile wide and a mile deep. And as we've been looking at the theme of Colossians chapter 2, verse 7, it says, let your roots grow down into Him and let your lives be built upon Him. God wants us to build our lives upon Him in a greater way, but the only way to do that above ground is to go deeper below ground. We started week number one with the concept of being rooted in love. It really starts there. That the Bible says to us very simply that God is love. And if we're going to reflect His love well, we need to receive it into our lives. Jesus summed up the law of the prophets in two commands. And He said very simply, Love Lord your God with all of your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then love your neighbor as yourself. As God wants us to love each other, the more that we get what I call the vertical relationship between us and God, this wonderful relationship, this direction, that it's easier for us to love this direction. Love is at the center and the foundation of it all. Week number two, we then started to talk about that of forgiveness. Forgiveness is so key, friends. I've seen too many Christians struggle in their walk with Christ later on at some point in time in their life because of unforgiveness. This unresolved thing that is inside of them that is eating at them because they haven't worked through whatever the issue is well. We need to forgive one another. Amen to that? Amen. And if you don't forgive, it'll start to eat at you from the inside out. In addition to that, not only do we need to forgive one another, but you also need to forgive yourself. There are times where it's easier for you to give for someone else than it is for you to forgive yourself. And the more that we get that concept and live it out, the better off we will be. Because unforgiveness, again, becomes a huge problem in us moving on in our relationship with the Lord. Week number three, we talked about the kingdom. That it's not about you, it's always about the Lord. And as Jesus prayed, he modeled the prayer for us, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. That we would choose to pray, Lord, I want your will, I want your purpose, I want your kingdom to happen in our world, in our community, in our lives. Not what I want, not coming at this thing from a selfish perspective, but rather from God's perspective. Week number four, we talked about the Word, the importance of being in the Word of God. If you want to get to know God well, you've got to get into the Word of God. The more that you know God's Word, the better off you will be in learning and understanding who He is in your life. But in addition to that, we also talked about not just listening to the Word and so deceiving yourselves, but making sure that you are a doer of the Word. So not just having a head knowledge or a heart knowledge, but literally a life knowledge. That as we know who God is, that we would live out His plans, His principles within our lives. Week number five then was that of faith. God wants our faith to be at a different level. This time next year, he, God wants your faith level, so to speak, to be at a different point than where it is today. It's one thing to have saving faith, which is great. The Bible says without faith it is impossible to please God. So God wants us to have saving faith. But beyond the saving faith, He wants your faith to grow. The really cool thing is that you can have faith as small as a mustard seed, and you can do powerful things. So it's, it's about having that faith. It's about growing upon that faith and letting it be built in your life. Then last week we looked at that of purpose, that you and I have been put on this planet for a reason, a bigger reason than what we may think that we ourselves would come to grips with. That God's will, His purpose wants to prevail within our lives, that He has 
formed you a particular way to carry out a bigger plan and a bigger purpose than what we may have imagined. And today, as we walk into week number seven, we want to talk about being rooted in power. Everybody say power. Power. That God wants to give you this amazing power. And as we look at that today, our verse before us is Acts chapter 1, verse 8. Why don't we stand together across this room today, and as we've been doing so, a part of this series, you'll see the, the, on the screens in front of you the verse that's there, Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where it says, But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Let's do it again. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Thank you. You may be seated. This power is incredibly important for us to draw upon. The word power there, as the Greek, is the word dunamis, which is where we get the word dynamite from. In other words, God wants to give you dynamic power in your life. <laughs> Jesus, as he hung a cross, willingly linked down his life for you and me, was buried in a borrowed tomb, and on the third day was raised from the dead of which we will get a chance to celebrate that in a couple of weeks. I, I look forward to Easter. I mean, I love Easter. I love Easter. It's not for the peeps and the eggs and all that stuff, you know, right? But a day to celebrate Jesus. We can celebrate that every day. That we serve a God who's alive. Not a God who's dead. We serve a God who's alive. And Jesus, as he was raised from the dead, before he ascended to heaven, he appeared to people on this earth. In fact, the Bible says on one occasion he appeared to over 500 people at one time. As Jesus appeared to them, and appeared to his disciples, he said to his disciples, he said to the twelve, he said to his followers, do not leave Jerusalem. Hang tight here, my paraphrase. Hang tight in Jerusalem until you receive the gift that my Father wants to give you. So they did so. They remained in the upper room. They were praying together. They were hanging out together. And within about 10 days after Jesus had ascended to heaven, on what's known as the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit descended upon them. We see in Acts chapter 2, that they began to speak in other tongues as the Holy Spirit enabled them. Many times people make this concept of the baptism of the Holy Spirit more about tongues than about the power of God. And I'm here today to tell you that tongues are an outward evidence of that and very important. The fact is, is that the Holy Spirit came upon them to empower them for ministry. But you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. Well, let's make sure that we get this thing right theologically. That when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior and Lord, God enters your life. He enters your heart. He enters who you are. The Bible says that as you accept Christ as your Savior and Lord, that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. So God dwells inside of you. I mean, that should be kind of really cool and maybe a little freaky all at the same time, right? God chooses to dwell inside of every single one of us here in this room today to have a relationship with Him. What an awesome thing it is, says. That it's the Spirit of Christ that enters us. But the Apostle Paul says to us in the New Testament, and he was talking to a bunch of Christians, be filled with the Holy Spirit. So this filling of the Holy Spirit goes beyond just that the Holy Spirit's inside of us. That we need to be filled to overflowing. You know, think about filling something up, whatever it may be. Maybe it's a five-gallon bucket. You fill it with water. You fill it with sand. That if it's, if it's filled, it's, it's, it's to the top. It's to the brim. And, and that God wants you to be filled to, in a sense, to overflowing with the Spirit of God. That the Holy Spirit would, in a sense, bubble over in your life. That He wants to be evident in and through you. 
And so this power of God is about this thing called the baptism of the Holy Spirit in Acts chapter 2. And I think about the baptism, the word baptize in the Greek New Testament comes from the word baptizo, which literally means to immerse in or to immerse under. Which is why when we baptize people at our church, we dunk them in water. Because you go under the water, you come back up again. You know, we don't keep them under there for, you know. Right? But you put them under the water, you come back up again. And, and it signifies in the same way that Jesus, when he died upon a cross, was buried in a grave. And then he was raised to new life. So God wants to give us new life. Well, that, that concept in water baptism then then translates the same kind of way into being baptized in the Holy Spirit, that God wants to immerse you in the Holy Spirit. He wants to do something that beyond just the Holy Spirit dwelling inside of you, He wants you to be fully immersed in who He is. And that's a choice that we need to make. The really cool thing is that, again, God's patient with us, and he wants you to come to a point where you invite him into your life that way. And so as I've said to us as a congregation many times over, let's make sure that we say yes to God. Because God's only going to give us good gifts, right? And if God only gives you good gifts, then, then we can trust him that he's only going to do good things in your life. And so start saying yes to God. Start inviting him to do new and fresh things. And for us to make that then a matter of prayer because it was in prayer that the Holy Spirit then descended upon them in that upper room 2,000 years ago. And it was said, and the Bible said, the text says in Acts 2, it was like tongues of fire that came and rested upon all of them. That God wants to do something in you, but when you pray, when you open up your heart and say, God, I'm open to what you have for me, do in my life what you see fit to do. And all of a sudden, God starts pouring some really cool things into your heart and into your life. It's when we're fearful of that, that we hold back and we don't really open up our heart to Him. So let's not do that. Let's engage what God has for us. And let's say, God, pour into my life. Do what you want to do. I want the power of God. I want every good thing that you want to give me. And my life is open to that. As a result of that, I've seen people... Baptize the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues at an altar. I, I've seen people baptize the Holy Spirit during during worship time, just in praise and adoration. All of a sudden, they start speaking in tongues, and it just comes out of their life. I, I personally went to an altar to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit when I was 18 years of age. It didn't happen there, but two nights later, kneeling by my bedside on a Tuesday night in my bedroom, that's where I received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. It just started coming out. It doesn't matter where it is. Your story is your story. But the God of all ages is in charge of everyone's story. And he starts doing things in your life as you are open to receiving what he wants to give you. So open up your heart to him. Receive from the Lord what he wants to give you. Today as we wind down this series, we talk about the power of God. I want to give you, if I may, four key thoughts that I think are really important for us to live out regarding the empowerment of the Holy Spirit in our lives, how God wants to empower you. Number one is this, is that God wants you to have maximizing power. Maximizing power. I want to put it in, in the framework of Stephen today. Stephen, who was a, a follower of Jesus. And, and you may recall how there were the 12 disciples, and, and Judas Iscariot betrayed Jesus, he ended up, you know, committing suicide and all of what took place with that. They chose Matthias to replace him. And as these 12 got together, they were leading the church. And the Bible says in the New Testament, in the book of Acts, that God added to their number daily those who were being saved. What a really cool thing that is. That God added to their number daily. There's all sorts of... <coughs> All sorts of people that, that are getting saved as a part of our church. And I love the fact that that's happening. But that's happening on a weekly basis for us, which is really cool. But back in the early church, every single day, people were getting saved. People were coming to know Jesus as their Savior and Lord. It's an awesome thing. 
And as I think about the saving knowledge of Christ and what he does in our lives, how important it is that we allow the Lord to continue to add. So as he was adding to their numbers, as the church was growing, there was a need to multiply the leadership of the church. So the 12 said, it wouldn't be right for us to neglect the preaching of the word of God in order to wait on tables, the distribution of food. It was <coughs> feed my sheep food bank 2,000 years ago concept, right? And so there were people that were doing this. So the 12 said, let's choose seven people from among us that can wait on the tables, that can help with the distribution of the food and, and take care of all of that. And one of the seven that was selected was this guy by the name of Stephen. Now it says in the text there in Acts chapter 6, verse 8, it says, now Stephen, a man full of God's grace and power, performed great wonders and signs among the people. <coughs> I want us to realize today, if I may, I apologize, you take a drink. I want us to realize today that as we think about Stephen's life, he started with something that was very basic. And in all of our lives, that's exactly what God does. <coughs> he takes sometimes the most menial tasks that you may have. And he does things through you in those menial tasks. How many of you have ever used a restroom here at our church? You've ever used a restroom, right? Raise your hand. How many of you are thankful for when the restroom is clean? Right? So the person who cleans the toilets at the church, are they important? Yes. Oh, there you go. That was awesome right there. Thank you very much for that. Right? Because sometimes we, we tend to think, oh, this is really important, that's really important, that next thing's really important. And other things aren't as important, but you just helped me to illustrate the point that, that everything is important, isn't it? The person who comes in, and we have a team of people that come into the office on Fridays, and stuff all these programs, all these bulletins with inserts so that you have sermon inserts and anything else that's going on that week. They, they, it takes them a couple of hours to do that, and, and they gladly do that. It's a great team of people, volunteers that come and do that. That's important. So the preaching of the Word of God is important. Stuffing bulletins is important. Cleaning toilets is important. In other words, whatever you do as you do it to the glory of God, it is important. <coughs> I share that with you because... Stephen was waiting on tables. And you may say to yourself, you know, wow, feed my sheep food bank. Is it really that big a deal? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because it's touching people's lives. And when you do what you do, and you do it to the glory of God, and you do it to the best of your ability, and you do it with a good attitude, <coughs> when all of that happens, then good things take place. God sees your heart. And he uses what you have to offer in moments like that to touch other people's lives. So Stephen was working in the food bank, but he was being used of God to perform great signs and wonders, as the text says here. He did so because his heart's in the right place. He did so because he was a man of God. He did so because the grace of God was upon him. He did so because he was empowered by the Holy Spirit. So in other words, friends, it's not about your title. Some of the most powerful people in the world have no title. Jesus held no political office when he was here on this planet. Yet he did amazing things, didn't he? So it's not about man-made titles. It's about what God does in and through you. In Acts chapter 6, verse 10, it says, Finally, be strong. Everybody say strong. strong. Be strong in the Lord and in His mighty power. So a choice we need to make today to gain strength in the Lord. Sometimes we feel more strong than others. And other times we feel like you're beat up by the world, right? We need to, no matter how we feel, Align ourselves with the strength of God. It was something, I'm preaching to you today, but, but on this particular point, I'm preaching to myself. And I'll illustrate it here in just a second. But the fact 
fact is that there's sometimes that, that we need to hear our own message as much as we need to proclaim it to other people. That God wants you to be strong in Him, and it's a choice you need to make. Because if you don't make that a choice of your life, it's easier for the feelings and the emotions to take over, and then all of a sudden, you're not feeling so strong in the Lord. Acts chapter 1, verses 4 and 5 says, On one occasion... While he was eating with them, he gave them this command, Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. We can go out and do ministry on our own, and we will have a certain effect. Or we can wait for the empowerment of the Holy Spirit, and it can be maximized to a different level. There are times, friends, that I've done some things in some people's lives, you have as well, that you've walked away from and said, you know, that wasn't that big a deal. And yet, for whatever reason, God took that and he maximized it. And he spoke into somebody's heart and, and it became something that was incredibly important for that person in that moment. And that's because the Holy Spirit showed up. See, friends, we can do things on our own, and we're going to fall flat on our face, but when we do it in the power of God, when we do it under the unction and the leading of the Holy Spirit, all of a sudden things are different in us and through us because God is a part of it. Oh, Maximizing power. We need it. A second thing that we need is that we need courageous power. Not only maximizing power, but courageous power. And the courage to look at the opportunities that are in front of us, as Leonard Ravenhill once said, the opportunity of a lifetime must be seized in the lifetime of the opportunity. It's a great statement. And in Acts 6, 9 and 10, in the following verses, in Stephen's life, it says, But one day, some men from the synagogue of the free slaves, as it was called, started to debate with him, referring to Stephen. There were Jews from Cyrene, Alexandria, Cilicia, and the province of Asia. None of them could stand against the wisdom and the spirit with which Stephen spoke. Now we don't know if Stephen was an eloquent person or not, but we do know this, that the emphasis was upon the Holy Spirit leading Stephen as he was standing up and saying what he did. There are moments in our lives, friends, that we need to be courageous people. God is asking us to be courageous, even in the midst of all sorts of other stuff that you are facing in your life. Have you ever felt like the enemy was throwing everything at you? Has that ever happened to you? Maybe you're in that season right now. In fact, I, I, I feel a little bit in that season, if I may say it that way. As I shared with you last Sunday that my dad passed away while I was in Africa on a missions trip, and it just, it just feels weird to not be able to pick up the phone and talk to my dad. My dad was a man who I could, I could just go to for advice. And, and not that I would necessarily do it a lot, but just the fact that I can't. It's just, it's just a weird feeling. I, I can't, I, I'm trying to wrap my head around it. Having both my mom gone and my dad gone, and, and you know, this 14 month period of time where you lose three of your four parents, it's just like, whoa, really? You lose your mother-in-law last January, and, and your mom in, in August, and then your dad here, and my dad in, in, in March, and, and I'm, I'm trying to figure this whole thing out and, and go, God, it's in your hands. On Wednesday, as Ron and I are, are packed up and ready to head to Arizona, I'm going to meet my brother, we're going to take care of some funeral arrangement types of things, and uh, as we're ready to leave, there's water all over the floor in, in the garage. So we're here like, great, the hot water tank must have busted or something happened. And so we shut the water off to the house and we called the plumbers to come in and those who plumbed the house and, and they came on Friday and we ended up getting into a hot water tank. We thought everything was fine and, and throw the hot water back on. They're gone at this point and about six hours later there's water still all over the floor. We're like, great, now what do we do? So I call the plumbers black back on Friday night, late at night, and they're going through all of what they're doing, and they're, they're like, yeah, you probably have a slab leak of some kind that's coming up under the house. And, you know, I'm thinking, Lord, I really don't need this right now. 
Not that anybody ever needs it, if you know what I'm saying, right? But in the midst of all this other stuff, you're here like, okay. And so you have to make a statement that you're going to stand firm. You have to make a statement that, you know, God, you're in control. And even though there's a lot of things that seem to be breaking in my life right now, I know you're a constant. And you're going to help get me through this. You're going to help me have my family through this. You're going to help walk with us in the midst of it all. It, it needs to be a proclamation of your life that you're going to be courageous in the midst of stuff that goes on, right? Choices that we need to make. Being courageous. Second Timothy chapter 1 verse 7 says, For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now we can become fearful when stuff happens, and that's exactly what the enemy wants to do. So my statement to you today is don't let the enemy win. I hate it when that happens. Don't let him win. Be strong in the Lord. And in his mighty power. Take your stand against the devil's schemes. For your struggle is not against flesh and blood, but it's against principalities and powers. It's about all this stuff that goes on in your life. And we realize that in the midst of that, the enemy is just using that to try to get at you. And the one thing that the enemy wants to do is to derail me. Right? If, if the enemy can derail me, then it's going to have a ripple effect on a lot of other people's lives, isn't it? Yeah. And the same is the case for you. If the enemy derails you, it's going to have a ripple effect in other people's lives. You've got to make a choice ahead of time. I'm not going to let that happen. Yeah. So part of this is like, you know, I, I, I hate it. I hate it when I'm the illustration of the message, right? <laughs> but there are moments where you just gotta live your, your life out loud and let people see, you know, I, I'm, not gonna, I'm not gonna be fearful. I'm not gonna take steps backwards. I'm gonna rather engage the power of the Holy Spirit. I'm gonna live a life of love. I'm gonna have a sound mind, even though it may be like, ah, what's going on, right? We need to be courageous and we need to keep going after it. The third thing that we need to do is that we need to have reflecting power. Maximizing power, courageous power, but also reflecting power. This reflecting power is, is amazing, really, when you think about it. Going back to Stephen's life. So here's this guy who has been selected. He's waiting on tables, and yet his attitude is wonderful. His heart is towards the Lord. God uses them in the midst of this ministry that may seem very basic. And then God raises him up to, to even give this speech and stand up for the cause of Christ. I mean, there's stuff happening in this guy's life. And, and, and in verse 15, we go a little bit further into the text. And, and it says, And all who were sitting in the Sanhedrin looked intently at Stephen. And they saw that his face was like the face of an angel. In other words, they were seeing the glory of God on Stephen's face. I want to remind you that when you get closer to God, you reflect His glory. A great example of that in the Old Testament is Moses. Whereas Moses went up on the hill and he met with God, when he would come down off the mountain, there would be this Shekinah glory that would be around him and people would see something visibly different in Moses because he was hanging out with God. The same is the case for us. The more that you hang out with the Lord, the more you start to reflect Him in your life. My prayer is that as I continue to live life, people would see less of me and more of Him. I hope that's your prayer as well. The way we handle certain things, then either reflect that well or don't, don't they? And it's not always in the easy times that we reflect the Lord the best. It's in the tough times that we can reflect the Lord the best way. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 16 through 18 says, But whenever someone turns to the Lord, the veil is taken away. So let that sink in for a second. The veil is taken away. I'll come back to that. For the Lord is the Spirit. And wherever the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. So all of us who have had that veil removed can see and reflect the glory of the Lord. And the Lord, who is the Spirit, makes us more and more like Him as we are changed into His 
glorious image. In other words, when you accept Christ as your Savior and Lord, as the text says right there, that the veil is removed. We see God more clearly than before we knew the Lord. Once you come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, there's something that happens. That veil is removed. We have a greater understanding of who God is. And the more that you get close to Him, the more that He starts to change you from the inside out. And as the text says, as we just read, and we become more and more like Him. And we are changed into His glorious image. So may we, as we grow in our relationship with Christ, continue to reflect that. That's something that Stephen did as he was standing up, as he was proclaiming to the Sanhedrin and the people who were there, as he was giving that speech, the glory of God was being reflected through him. It was something that was attractive that gained their attention. Fourth and final thing, I think that's really important for us to get today about the power of God, is that God wants us not only to have maximizing power, courageous power, reflecting power, but he also wants us to have finishing power. Finishing power. You find out a lot about a person as to how they finish the race. I've had employees before, pastors, workers, people at our church here, people at churches where I've been before. You find out a lot about who they are when it's time for them to leave. Because some people leave well, and some people leave horribly. Some people, once they feel like it's time to leave, they mentally check out, and it's like they're done. And you're like, uh, excuse me, you're still getting a paycheck. What's your problem? Right? Because they don't finish well. And other people, you find out what they're made of because they go the extra mile to make it easier for the next person who steps in. The same is the case for us spiritually. As I think about my dad and reflect upon his life and how he lived his life and how he loved Jesus to the very end, he finished well. And Stephen is another one who unbelievable finish to his life, yet he finished well. Acts chapter 7, verses 57 through 60, just a small portion of the text. And it says, at this, they covered their ears. And yelling at the top of their voices, they all rushed at him, meaning Stephen, and dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile, the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. I'll come back to that in a second. And while they were stoning him, Stephen prayed. This is what he prayed. Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Or another way of saying it is, he died. He fell asleep in that those who are believers... That's the reference point because to be absent from the body is to what? To be present with the Lord. And so Jesus is on the other side of that with his arms open wide, welcoming Stephen into that relationship. I think about what happens there and how powerful it is that we understand what is taking place. Because, see friends, when things get tough, sometimes we pray, Lord, take it from me. That's human nature, isn't it? Lord, take it from, I don't want to go through this. Even Jesus prayed that prayer, prayer right? In the Garden of Gethsemane, Father, if it's possible, may this cup be taken from you. Jesus even prayed that, right? But he said, nevertheless, not my will, but yours be done. In other words, if it's not possible, I will go through whatever I've got to go through. And Stephen, as he's proclaiming what he is, he becomes the first martyr of the church. And what's amazing about martyrdom is that the blood of the martyrs has always become the seed of the church. In other words, as blood is spilt, 
God takes that, and it's amazing what he does to produce something greater than what we could have ever imagined. It's in the midst of this martyrdom that though it may, by human standards, look tragic at the moment, God uses that circumstance to bring about an amazing growth of the church. Because, friends, our ways are not His ways. But we've got to realize that there are moments that God has something bigger in store that in this situation where Stephen had to go through this momentary but incredibly intense pain. I mean, I can't imagine being stoned to death. Where somebody puts you out there and all of a sudden everybody's pelting you with rocks until you die. I can't imagine what that's like. I don't think there's any of us in this room that really can comprehend that. But in the midst of all of that, he kept his focus. How many of us in the room would have said, God, pull down some lightning and zap every one of these people right now? <laughs> and yet Stephen's praying, Lord, don't hold it against me. Receive my spirit. There, there's a depth of relationship with Jesus that's, a, that's profound at that moment. I can think throughout human history when someone would be sacrificed or some incredibly intense thing would take place, how God would always use that to multiply the church. One of my friends, when I was in seminary, was a missionary behind the Iron Curtain of the old Soviet Union, Eastern Europe. And it was really funny because back in the, back in the 80s when we were in a seminary together, he had this Soviet Union sweatsuit that he would wear, the, the famous you know, blue sweatsuit, if you're old enough to remember this thing, with CCCP on the back of it, and, and a, a sickle and star, and I mean, the emblem, it was, it, was, it was genuine. And he would always throw this thing on and, and run around campus, do his, do his jog around campus, and people always look at it like, who is that guy? And in the midst of being a missionary to Eastern Europe, and to this, these, you know, behind the Iron Curtain, of his day. He talked about how the church, when it was established in homes, would always be ready from the instant it was established to be multiplied into three churches if something happened and the government would step in. And it's, he said it would happen all the time. The government would step in, find out about a house church, and rip the house up, and, and immediately they were ready to go to three churches. And it happened so many times that the government that started to back away from doing this because they knew that they were producing more churches whenever it took place. That's a level of Christianity that maybe not where all of us are today. I think about what's going on currently in the nation of China, where it is illegal to have a relationship with Jesus. And all these house churches are meeting. This underground church is millions strong in China today. Because whenever something is difficult, it weeds out those who are serious from those who are just playing the game. I hope today that as you come into this room and we worship the Lord together that we're not just playing the game but we're serious about a relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen. That that's where we are in our hope and our relationship with Him. I share that with you because of how important it is that we realize that Stephen lived his life out loud the right kind of way to the very end. And because he ended it well, God used that powerfully. There was a young guy standing there. His name was Saul. And they put all his coats his direction and say, hey, you watch the coats. We're going to pump this guy. And Saul was and it's just cheering it on in the day. But if you go a few more chapters later, you know that Saul, God grabbed a hold of his life. And struck him down blind for three days on the road to Damascus. Radically changed his life around. His name was then changed from Saul to Paul. 
God used him all throughout the Mediterranean region area to share Jesus Christ. For as someone who was as passionate against the cause of Christ, God used him once his life was turned around to be passionate for the cause of Christ. I want to remind you that God does not allow your experiences of life to fall on deaf ears. But rather, He builds upon those things that you have done in the past, good or bad, to help ultimately shape you if your heart is towards Him, and how then you can then bring other people into relationship with the Lord. Philippians 1.6 says very simply, be confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ Jesus. And in 1 John 4.4 4 it also says, you dear children are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. Praise God for that. And that's another text says, he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. So in the midst of whatever it is that you may be facing, and you're going through a time of trial, whether that's happening now, or it's happened in the past, or may happen in the future, know this, that he who is in you is able, friends. He's able to get you through this. He's able to help you in the midst of what it is that you face. That I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. That we can walk this road together, we can help each other out, and God can use this as we are rooted. The more that you are rooted in Him and rooted in God's power, the more that His power is in evidence in your life and you can stand up against the things that the enemy stands against you with. The conclusion very simply is, let's be rooted in power. Let's make the choice to be rooted in Him. Would you bow your heads with me across this room today? Dear Heavenly Father, we call upon your name, and as we do so, we thank you for ministering amongst us. And I pray, Lord, that in the sound of my voice, that if there be some who do not know you, Lord, that you would bring life and blessing and encouragement into their hearts and lives. That they would reach out to you and accept Jesus Christ as their Savior, Lord. That today would be their day, that now would be their time. Friends, as we just bow in God's presence today, if you would like what I'm talking about, if you'd like to build that relationship upon Jesus Christ, I would love to pray for you. I'm not going to sing you out, I'm not going to embarrass you, but I'd like to pray for you. Wherever you are here in this room, you want that walk with the Lord, you want that eternal life, you want your sins forgiven. I'm going to ask for you to boldly raise your hand. And by raising your hand, you're saying, Pastor John, would you pray for me? I want what you're talking about. I want that relationship with Jesus. Go ahead and raise your hand. Just grab my attention. Put it right back down. Thank you. I see one, two hands. Three, four. Thank you. Five. Thank you. Six, seven. Eight. Thank you. Nine. Thank you. I'd like to lead us in the prayer of dedication of our hearts and lives to Christ. I'm going to ask all of us to pray together. But for those of you that raised your hand today, deny me. Today's your day. Now is your time. Reach out to Him. Allow Him to touch your life today. Give you eternal life. Let's all pray together, shall we? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus into this world to die upon the cross to save us from our sins. Today, Lord Jesus, I put my hope and I put my trust in you. Please forgive me of my sin. Give me eternal life. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's celebrate that. Today, before we go, we have something that's very important that we set aside as a miracle that we're going to do today. You're going to be a part of a miracle. I believe you for that. I'm going to show you a video here in just a moment of one of our missionaries, Mary Mann. She's a missionary to Costa Rica. She's in need of a vehicle. Interestingly, she's totally fine to use a vehicle. A vehicle that will help her to get to certain areas where she's doing some after school programs for some kids who are basically throwaway kids in society there in that nation. And as we have opportunity on all nine campuses today, 
We're receiving an offering, a special offering. Some of you took the Pringles can challenge. That's what I hold here. You wrapped your Pringles can, ate your potato chips, and then started putting money inside. Here's the simple math. If 500 people on our nine campuses would give $30, that's $15,000 that car is purchased, we'll be able to put the keys in her hand and she'll be able to get to where she needs to go. 15000 bucks. That's where our goal is today. If you've done the Pringles Can Challenge, you've been putting money inside of it. This is something actually, this is a side note, we do this every year, uh, Rhonda and I do, throughout the year. And uh, we, we take all of our recycling, we stick it in here, I think, what, what do we count off, $179? Interesting, $179 of recycling for the year. We just set aside, we, we just, once a year we'll bring it and put it in this be light offering. Today, you see some treasure chests here, and there's gonna be other receptacles for you to be able to come forward in just a moment. I'd like to show you this video. At the conclusion of the video, I'm gonna ask that you would come forward. As you're making out a check, make it out to First Assembly of God. If you are making out a check today, if you've got your frequency can, you can bring it forward and put it in, uh, uh, continue this. That's coming forward. It's, it'll be a, a, a heart that's here. We'd love to receive those. And then I'd love to be able to report back to you what the miracle is next Sunday. Take a look at the video, if you will. Hi, First Assembly. This is Mary Mann, your missionary in Costa Rica. I'm here in the community of Linda Vista, where I minister most of the time. And I want to thank you for your involvement in the Speed the Light Challenge. Thank you for helping raise money for my car so that I can come up to this community and minister to the girls and the boys. We're helping girls have dignity, understand the value they have in Christ, and prepare them for the future that Jesus has for them. And also we're mentoring boys so that they can be a godly men, good fathers and good husbands and bring about change in this community. So I thank you for your contribution taking the challenge, and being a blessing to many young men and women in Costa Rica. God bless you. Amen. So as you're ready today, when the worship team leads us, why don't we stand together, bring the cans forward, bring your offering forward, and then you can be dismissed. God bless you. you are